welcome to this session on explaining a China fraud. Uh, we're going to have a little game here. We're going to create a fraudulent Chinese company and list it on AIM. Uh, I can see there's a corporate advisor sitting at the back of the room, so uh, he can help it, and I'm sure you'll charge a very reasonable fee, uh, Mr. Greensmith. Uh, the, the statistics about China fraud on AIM are really terrifying. We started tracking AIM listed China frauds in Sirius uh, on June the 1st last year. At that point, uh, and with two listings since, uh, there were 40 China stocks, uh, stocks that were uh, either completely Chinese or largely Chinese stocks listed on the casino. I think there were 38, two have listed since. Of those 40, 17 have already been booted off the AIM market. Uh, I'm going to predict at the end three more, uh, which I think will be toast by Christmas or perhaps early New Year. Most of them have been booted off because they have been outright frauds. Uh, AIM being AIM, it doesn't actually say this company is a fraud. We just have a quiet thing, resignation of nominated advisor, no one else is prepared to act for it, and the company disappears into the long grass. But they have been, without doubt, complete frauds. Uh, the, of the 40, there are two companies which have actually delivered spectacularly good returns for investors. And that goes to show that not every Chinese company on the AIM casino is a fraud. Hutchison China Med MedTech has done incredibly well. All Asia Asset, which I can't really get my head around, uh, appears to have done very well, at least in share price terms. If we strip those two out, and we'll take out two of the minus 100%, of which there are many, uh, you're left with 36 stocks. The average loss since IPO on those 36 stocks is just under 90%. Even by the standards of AIM, that is a pretty bad return. So, uh, what I want to do today is go through the mechanics of how we in this room are going to create a fraudulent company based in China. What we need to do is we start with a company which does exist, but is just a mom and pop operation. Uh, it's something that makes a few quid profit, but nothing to write home about. Um, but at least it is a company. We could take as a case study there, Naibu. Naibu was a company which made a few sneakers in the Fujian province of China. I don't doubt for a minute that the company actually existed. We actually know an awful lot about this company, including the fact that its CEO, Hoi An Lin, had faced 800 criminal charges for stealing money before the company listed. Oddly enough, this information wasn't in the prospectus. Uh, it was something that no one felt necessary to disclose to investors. Generally, I would have thought that knowing that a CEO had faced 800 criminal charges for stealing money would be something that I would want to know before I invested in a company. It would be a little bit of a deterrent for me. I accept that, many, that a good number of CEOs on AIM are thieves, um, but I'd like to know that this guy has actually been caught and has done it on multiple occasions. But he owned a company. He owned a small little company. It was worth maybe £100,000. Uh, it made a tiny profit, it made a few sneakers. So for us to create our China fraud, we need to find a small company like that. Let's use uh, maybe the pizza restaurant in Clerkenwell. We'll move that out to China. It is a pizza restaurant, it makes a few quid profit. That is our base company. What then happens is you get in an expert advisor. Uh, the advisor of choice has been a firm called ZX. ZX Capital is based in London. It is not regulated by the, uh, the FCA. Um, it has, however, worked on a number of China floats. What ZX does is it manufactures a new company. It sets a new company up in somewhere like the British Virgin Islands to acquire the issued share capital of our existing company and it dresses this up for flotation. ZX uh, gets some equity in the new company. It has no lock-in. It will be selling on day one when the company is listed. 
We then need to find some accountants who will sign off on what are completely bogus reports and accounts. Because we know that our little China company is only making 10,000 quid profit a year, or nothing, some trivial number. However, uh, we have to present to the AIM market data showing that not only is it making a couple of million quid profit a year, but it also has large amounts of cash sitting in the bank. Not every auditor will sign off on a set of accounts which shows this because, as we in the room know, this is in fact completely made up. There is no money in the bank. There are no multi-million pound profits. It is all a figment of the imagination. Now, you would have thought that auditors uh, would take this sort of thing seriously. They would check. I'm not sure quite as what has gone on here, but there have been two firms of auditors in particular which have signed off on numerous bogus, bogus uh, um, uh, documents for flotation uh, uh, and numerous bogus sets of accounts. The firms of UHY Hacker Young and especially Crow Clark Whitehill have signed off on most of the companies which have already been kicked off the AIM casino for being frauds. Uh, they've also signed off on the accounts of a number of uh, China AIM companies which are still listed and which are still frauds and which will be kicked off in due course. It could be that there is someone within these firm of auditors uh, who is prepared to sign off on something that they know is a lie. I very much doubt that. They are respected city professionals, so of course they would not behave in that way. I think it is more likely that they are just rather stupid and gullible and believe uh, whatever they're told, and they are hoodwinked. So when they are told that a China company has got 40 million quid in the bank, they will be presented with a statement showing that there is 40 million quid on a current account in a Chinese bank. And at that point, there may well actually be 40 million quid in the bank at that very point. A day later, of course, there'll be nothing there. But at the point that they are shown the data, there was 40 million quid. It goes, it's there, it will reappear in a year's time for the audit, but in between, it's not actually there. It just turns up once a year to get the audit signed off. And there are certain firms of accountants who seem to think that this is acceptable, uh, and they have signed off on numerous completely bogus uh, sets of accounts. The next thing we need to do is we need to find a nominated advisor who will sign off on our ridiculous, completely full of lies, not mentioning the criminal convictions prospectus, and will act for us as we pump out a series of lies to investors. Uh, the way that the City of London works is that there are a number of nominated advisors who are completely strapped for cash. Uh, I think you'll find that one of them, Daniel Stewart, will be featuring in a main stage presentation later today. Uh, those people will float anything they need to, because they have high fixed overheads, that is to say staff, coke and hookers, and palatial offices. And in order to support that, they need to have a sausage machine of floating new companies on AIM. If you act for a company on AIM as its nomad, you may get a retainer of 20, 30, 40,000 a year. If you can float a new company on AIM, you will be earning 150, 200,000 pounds, even before you've raised money for it. So you find a nomad who is desperate and who will take the work. And there are a number of them out there who need the work and they will float it. So we've created our bogus Chinese company. We now need to find, we've got some fictitious accounts. We now need to find a nomad who is desperate for cash. Some of them are so desperate. Daniel Stewart, I shouldn't pick on them, but I will. Daniel Stewart, last year, in 2014, was, as it ever, running out of money. It happens about once every six months around at Daniel Stewart. They faced a cash crunch. They had a company called Naibu as a client, which was patently a fraud. And uh, so they decided they'd float a company just like it. In fact, the website for the company they tried to float, Fraspens, was a cut and paste from Naibu. They knew their existing client was a fraud, and they tried to float a company with a website which had just been cut and paste from the Naibu one. So it's easy to find a nomad who will float uh, this company. You then go to uh, investors on the London market, uh, and you say, we have got lots of money in the bank, 
And we are hugely profitable and cash generative because here are the accounts with the made-up numbers, which you all believe because they've been signed off by a respected firm of auditors. But we'd like to raise a bit more. And you need to find an excuse for why you need to raise a bit more. There is a growth in demand for sneakers in China because of the uh, converse of the one-child policy. Make it up. Uh, there's a company called Jason, which makes wooden doors. Because of the changing demographics of the housing Chinese market, uh, wooden doors is a big growth market, and we need to raise a little bit more money to sate uh, the insatiable demand for wooden doors. You might think that wooden doors are a commodity over in England, but in China, this is a niche growth market, so we need to raise a bit of money. In order to impress the investors, uh, you will arrange a few fake site visits. With Naibu, uh, the company I know attempted to get a friend of mine to be non-executive director. And uh, they called this guy up and he said, well, as it happens, I'm in China. Um, I'd be quite happy to come and visit your factory. I can get on a plane. I'll be there tomorrow. And they, they said, thank you for that. And they called him back 20 minutes later and said, we've done some due diligence on you. You're not fit to be a non-executive director. The reason for that was, of course, that had he gone to visit their factory, he would have discovered it didn't exist. The factory that is in the prospectus just did not exist. Uh, the factory they had was a tiny little workshop somewhere else. They needed time to arrange a fake site visit for investors and analysts. And when you have a fake site visit, you go and see this great big new factory with sign, branded signs up at the top. The factory exists. In order to give credibility to our flotation, you need to have some English non-executive directors. Uh, we are a little bit uh, jaded about investing in Chinese companies, so we will have some respectable people on the board. Uh, I didn't go to the right school, so I'm not qualified for it, uh, but the sort of people who are on the board are people who are friends of Evil Knievel. They went to a proper public school. They have double-barreled names, uh, and their fathers uh, uh, were respectable people serving in the military. They are members of the right club in London, and no one would doubt their integrity. Uh, they are Tim, nice but terribly dim, and they'll just take the money. And we have a pattern of these people. They are very respectable, pucker members of the community. No one would doubt their integrity, and they just take the money. These people tend to take the money. You give them clear evidence they are on the board of a company which is a fraud, uh, and, but they'll stay there until they stop getting their checks. At that point, they show they've got some spine and resign. Uh, you then get a specialist PR firm in. Uh, if you look at the China frauds, you'll see that most of them are represented by just two firms. The big one is Abchurch Communications because they are specialists in China companies. Uh, they know exactly what to say. They understand the companies. And of course, they are very respectable members of the community as well. And before you list, you ensure that you have a, a shareholding structure which is a little bit different to a normal company. The original Chinese company, which you will remember, doesn't actually have a big factory but has a little workforce, only makes a few thousand quid a year and has got nothing in the bank, has been bought out by a British Virgin Islands, Channel Islands, or some other dodgy offshore tax regime like Isle of Man-based company. And at the end of that, you will find the shareholding structure is very simple. About 50% of the stock will be owned by the CEO. Another 40% will be owned by a series of special purpose vehicles, the ownership of which is unclear, and which appear to have only just been created. Uh, they are, in fact, the CEO as well, but we don't talk about that. The remaining 10% is the money which the company manages to raise in London from particularly stupid institutional investors. The company may have 40 million quid in the bank, but it will raise another two, three, four, five million quid from investors at the time of the IPO. Why does it raise this four or five million pounds? Well, uh, it's pretty simple. Um, it raises that f those five or six million pounds because the IPO itself is going to cost half a million quid. The ongoing PLC costs, having a nomad, a broker, etc., a very posh PR girl, that will maybe cost it half a million quid a year as well. 
and it is going to pay dividends because this company which we have created and which doesn't actually have any profits or any assets is going to be a yield stock. <coughs> the company itself, of course, isn't making any profits. It's not generating any cash. So it needs cash raised in the West to pay for the PLC costs, to pay for the bogus dividends, etc., etc. The maths are pretty simple on this. Uh, in the case of Naibu, it raised about £6 million at the time of its IPO. Uh, that £6 million was used to pay the PLC costs, the listing costs, and the cash dividend. All the way along with Naibu, it said there is a cash dividend, which Western investors took, and the Chinese investors were offered, everyone was offered a script dividend, and the Chinese investors kept on taking script dividend. So the cash cost of supporting the dividend wasn't that great, uh, but the company could say that it was yielding 8, 9, 12, 15, 28, whatever you want percent. And on that basis, you would find that the Investors Chronicle would tip the shares as a buy, evil Knievel. Uh, and Keen Investors Chronicle reader bought some shares in Naibu. And all the way along, people would buy shares in Naibu. The net result was that Naibu got six million in at the beginning, and during the course of the time that it was on AIM until it was suspended, it had another 20 million come in from people buying shares off those special purpose vehicles registered in the British Virgin Islands, which were in fact the CEO, but would pretend that they weren't. So the net benefit to Naibu was that it got 26 million pounds from British investors. In return, it probably had to spend a couple of million, three million on the fake dividends, uh, and maybe two or three million on its PLC costs and its listing costs. Net gain from this fraud for NIBU shareholders, 20 million. Simple, you've made 20 million. We could do the same with our, our bogus company. All we need to do is find an advisor, desperate, for fees, prepared to take on any old rubbish. Any advisor in the room want to admit to that? Uh, he's not smiling, and I'm only kidding. Uh, we need to find a, a nice but dim PR girl who'll do it. We need to find a respectable member of the community, someone who is, went to the right school. Uh, Jason, which school did you go to? Where? Okay, that doesn't count, so you can't be it. Anyone here who went to Eton or Harrow, you can apply to be uh, the non-exec on the company. All you need to do is just turn a blind eye to anything and take the money. We can float the Chinese company. We can make a quick 20 million by a similar fraud. You don't need to have a real company to start with. So that's how it works. Uh, the problem, uh, this is something that could be dealt with. The problem is that, A, the authorities have hitherto turned a blind eye to it. There has been clear evidence of fraud at a number of these companies. In the case of Naibu, uh, we broke the story that the CEO had actually been put in prison. Not for his past crimes, but for new crimes. He was put in prison in November 2014, and the shares carried on trading. There was no announcement to the market. Uh, uh, it was just the fact he was in prison. Uh, and he is still in prison, and he will be there for a very long time. But shares in this company carried on trading. In any other world, I would have thought that is the sort of thing that companies should announce. Our CEO is in the slammer because he's a crook. Uh, but nothing happened. Uh, what do we need to do here is there are certain people who have been involved in numerous China frauds. There are the auditors who signed off on patently bogus accounts. Uh, those people have paid a lot of money. Something has to happen to them. Uh, in the city, we've got to, we've got to uh, go with the principle that if you do something wrong, either actively or if you're paid a large amount of money and you just goof, you turn a blind eye, you have to pay the penalty. The firms have to be reprimanded and the individuals involved in that thing, involved in turning a blind eye, have to be struck off. That would get some bad eggs out of the, the basket, but it would also act as a deterrent to others. Uh, there are people at the nomads and brokers who turned a blind eye. In the case of Naibu, uh, the final uh, uh, signal uh, that something was wrong was when the CEO himself tried to sell half his holding. Uh, normally what happens with the China fraud is 
the company carries on paying a dividend whilst the special purpose BVI companies, which are actually the CEO but we don't tell anyone, sell all their shares. At the end of the process when they have sold all their shares, the company then creates an excuse for why all the money's gone and they can't pay a dividend anymore. And shortly after, they are kicked off aim. In the case of, which company was it, Nigel? The one that said, we have to give money back to our suppliers. Cam Kids, thank you. Cam Kids was a company which apparently was sitting on a mountain of cash. Its excuse for getting rid of the cash, which of course didn't exist in the first place, was that it had to pay that cash back to suppliers because it was changing its distribution agreements. Why did it have to pay the cash suppliers? Because they, we don't know, because actually if you look at the report and accounts, the suppliers hadn't paid for the, the sneakers they bought in the first place. So the suppliers don't pay for the goods, but they have to be refunded in full. And that is why the cash all disappeared. In the case of other companies, they explain that they have to build a great big new factory because the existing one just doesn't have the capacity to meet demand. And of course they pay uh, the amount for this factory which cannot be justified under any circumstances. It, they pay the amounts like they were building the factory in central New York, let alone rural China. But that's where all the money goes. And then they say, well, there's a problem with labor supply. So we can't actually use the factory and we're going to have to get rid of it and we're not going to be able to get much back for it because it wasn't worth what we paid for it in the first place. Hey, presto, all the cash has disappeared. You make that excuse after all the bogus BVI shareholders, i.e. the CEO, has sold all his shares. At that point, there is no point continuing the fraud because you've got your money out. You've made your net 20 million. Uh, in the case of NIBU, though, they went one stage further. They had got all that money out. They'd made their 20 million. The CEO then approached his nomad, Daniel Stewart, and said, I know I've just taken a script dividend because I said I didn't need the cash, but actually something's come up and I want you to place out half my shares in the company. That should have been a red flag. People should have realized at that stage, even Daniel Stewart, that this was a complete fraud. They did nothing. They didn't tell the market. Unfortunately for them, I did tell the market about this because I heard about it. But Daniel Stewart should have told the market they should have resigned and they should have reported him to the authorities. They did not. The individuals at Daniel Stewart who turned a blind eye to this fraud, didn't report it to the market, allowed people to carry on buying shares in a company which they knew was a fraud, are still working in the city. They are still floating companies, advising companies. Now, if we were going to do something about it, we would say, I'm sorry guys, your crimes are so serious, we're going to name, shame you, fine you heavily so that you're selling the big issue going forward and you're homeless and you're never going to work in the city again. That is the way to deal with this issue. I would suggest to you that of the remaining 23 uh, Chinese companies listed on AIM since uh, uh, June 1st, a good number of frauds. If the AIM authorities wanted to do something about it, what it would do is it would say in every single case there has to be an independent forensic report by someone like KPMG uh, or uh, BDO, someone credible, not a Mickey Mouse firm of accountants, and we have to verify they're a fraud. The company's got to pay for it, they're all sitting on huge cash piles, uh, and if the company refuses to cooperate, they're thrown off the market immediately. That should be done for every single China stock, and we can root out the problem. So are all 23 of the remaining companies on AIM, uh, which come from China, frauds? No. Uh, I suspect that uh, 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 some of them are real businesses. Uh, maybe they make up their numbers a bit, but they are real businesses. Uh, but some of them are actually probably some quite good businesses. Not all of them will be frauds. Some of them, however, are clearly, to me, uh, frauds. Nigel Somerville, who's uh, sitting in the back here, uh, is even more of a guru uh, on uh, uh, the China uh, frauds than I. We, we reckon there are three which are slam dunk frauds. We've called them frauds before. They're welcome to sue both of us for libel. Um, and the numbers make it pretty clear that they are frauds. Those three are Jiasen, uh, which is the company which says that uh, 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 making wooden doors is not a commodity market, but due to the changing demographics of China, this is the growth opportunity. Now, you and I might have read a, a few things about a slowdown in China, about ghost cities which have no people whatsoever. 
but apparently this doesn't affect the wooden door market in China. Giantson shares are now trading at 5p or something like that, just about that. They were floated uh, less than 18 months ago at 82p. Uh, the company is nominally profitable. Uh, its market cap is now about 7 million quid. Uh, it's sitting on cash of 30 million, 40 million, something like that. Uh, it's trading at a huge discount to cash. Uh, if you believe the company, it's on a P of 1, 2, something like that, and it's a good yield play. People who've been investing for a while know that if it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. This company is nominally uh, trading at 70% discount to cash. It is the yield play. It's what you should put in your income portfolio. It's the growth play. It's on a P of more or less nothing. The numbers are quite simply bogus. Uh, a friend of Nigel's and I has actually been to visit the factory, and he would not uh, disagree with us about the fact that the numbers are completely made up. Yet the pretense continues. Uh, JQW is the next one we'll call out a fraud. Uh, its operations, if they really exist, have currently been suspended uh, because the company was apparently involved in criminal activities, uh, multi-level marketing. Uh, like Giasen, its shares have collapsed from 70p IPO to about 5p. It's trading uh, on a P of probably about one. Uh, it's uh, trading at a huge discount to cash. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a yield play, but no doubt it will say that it is a yield play at least until the insiders have sold all their shares. It is blatantly uh, a fraud. Uh, the other one is called Ahua Clean Energy. We'll call that one out a fraud too. Again, its, trade, its shares have collapsed from whatever they were floated out, a quid, whatever, to just pennies but it's still worth seven or eight million quid. Uh, it's trading at a huge discount to reported net cash, very low P, dividend, you know the rest. These companies are just made up. Their numbers are made up. There has been a conspiracy amongst a group of advisors to turn a blind eye to fraud. It is obvious now that they are frauds. Um, you now know exactly how a China fraud works. I suspect, I don't want to pick on the Chinese here, you will find that there are British companies or uh, other companies on own which are not from China which operates in the same way. This is not a condemnation of China, but we're just saying that on AIM there has been an industrial scale machine to float such fraudulent enterprises on the market and steal money from British investors over the past five years. That's it. Do we have time for any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm a deaf old man. Joy, what's your shout? Sorry? Okay, well, the, 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 the key with the fraud, obviously, is to do the fraud as far away from, uh, as to list a fraud, as far away from the actual fraud as is possible. Uh, if we were to float a fraudulent enterprise based in London, the best place to float it is somewhere else. Uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we, it's easier to do due diligence on a London company if you're London advisors. Uh, so the, advi the advisors to Globo, for instance, should have been able to go and check that its British distributor was based in a council flat and didn't really exist, because it was only three miles away from their offices. They didn't. But we digress. It, you, it is the distance thing. Chinese companies actually have floated fraudulent Chinese companies around the world. Uh, there's one place in China which specializes in fraud, which is the Fujian province. Uh, if you do a Google search or if you search share profits, you'll see that there are, have been a number of Fujian frauds on the Frankfurt market. Uh, there have been quite a lot of China, uh, 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 dodgy China floats in America, Singapore as well. It has been a global phenomenon. AIM, I think, has been easy just because AIM regulation is the loosest in the world. Uh, I think if floating, if you're a good Chinese company, and there are many very good Chinese companies, you would be mad to list on the casino. You would go and list in Shanghai or Hong Kong because uh, there it is easier to raise money, your stock will get a higher rating, and there is more liquidity in your stock. So good companies will list there, and there are very many good Chinese companies which will list in those markets. It is the bad ones which tend to list London, Frankfurt, New York especially. Um, AIM, 
well, if, you, if anyone here reads my, 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 my work, uh, the AIM regulation system is something of a joke. Uh, we have pointed out uh, to AIM regulation uh, slam dunk frauds from British companies, from Quindell. Uh, AIM regulation had the evidence a year ago. They did nothing about it. The FRC did something about it. The Serious for Office is doing something about it. Belatedly, the company did something about it. But AIM regulation is a joke because they don't take serious uh, reports of fraud seriously. And also, the big thing is, they do not uh, uh, slam individuals. Uh, fraud is never committed by companies. Fraud is committed by individuals. The way that AIM needs to change is to say that if you are a nomad or a broker and you break, or a CEO and you break the law, you are fined heavily and you are sent to prison. That is the way regulation should work. But AIM never does that. There are nomads who have failed seriously and serially, not just on China frauds but on other frauds. No one is ever sanctioned. So I guess uh, people just thought AIM was an easy, uh, uh, easy market to go for. There are no rules. Uh, and uh, you've always got the Investors Chronicle to tip your shares here. Any other questions? Sorry? A bear to have a large... Well, it's because they've issued large numbers of shares at a premium to, um, at a premium to the nominal price. Um, th these companies will always be issuing shares because there, there is really nothing there. Uh, if you say, what, is, what are the net assets in the company? Well, they're partly they're made up, uh, but there are no real assets. This is all a game about issuing shares and persuading you to buy the shares which I own. That is fraud. There's, the, when you, when you, uh, we have the Sam Antar presentation uh, later. There is one thing there. If you are running an honest private company and you are a fraudster, your sole objective is to pay as little tax as possible. You minimize the profits and you avoid paying tax. You may cheat on your sales tax, etc. You make a little bit of money. Moving into the public arena is about inflating your profits and selling all your shares to mugs. Uh, that is a different game. You make far more money by listing a fraud and making up profits than selling your shares. It's a better way to do fraud. Right. Five, I know we've got five minutes. We've got one more question, please. Let me fill the time. The problem is you can't short most of these shares. Uh, you know, people say uh, 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 that when uh, uh, I write something, it's so that I can have a short position ahead of it, or so uh, some of my friends in the global shorting conspiracy can take a short position. The reality is that for nearly all of these shares, you cannot short them. Uh, and uh, why, why I write about it is A, because it's jolly good fun, um, and B, to warn people that they shouldn't be buying them. Uh, these, these frauds will fail. I mean, if we assume that AIM regulation is going to do nothing about it. The way to purge the China frauds from the system is quite simply for all investors just to boycott them. If we British investors fail to buy the shares of these companies, then they can't commit the fraud because the fraud is all about finding British investors to buy shares of these bogus BVI accounts, which is really the CEO. Uh, so you can't actually short them. They're not shorting opportunities. The purpose of writing about them or talking about them is to warn people that they shouldn't be buying the shares, hopefully also to warn certain advisors that they shouldn't be representing them uh, and that they should be thinking twice about whether they take on these clients. I would hope that there would be advisors out there who act for companies like JQW or Jyerson who would think um, uh, that actually it's immoral to do this because all you're doing is you're taking a small amount in allowing a fraud to continue where insiders sell worthless stock to mug punters. I would hope that there would be some advisors in the city who would say the moral thing to do, it's not about protecting investors who are in there already, they've lost their money. It's about preventing new saps from being having their money stolen and therefore they should resign and have these companies cleaned off the market. So it's a message to advisors as well as to investors. Do institutions, I think the institutions would never buy in the secondary market. There was a time before it became so obvious that this was an industrial fraud machine 
when these companies initially listed that some institutions would have a small amount. Um, and so when MyBoo initially raised six million quid, I would imagine that some of that was from small cap institutions. Uh, they have learned their lesson. As a general rule, small cap institutions are boycotting the lower reaches of AIM anyway, uh, and therefore uh, uh, they wouldn't be investing in the secondary market. And I think if you tried to list a China company on AIM tomorrow, uh, you would find it more or less impossible to get any institutional uh, support at all. In fact, you find it impossible. You probably find it pretty much impossible to get any support. Sorry. Ah, well, I think if you think that having institutions on board is comfort, I suggest that you wait for the uh, Sam Antar and Evil Knievel presentations on the main stage later because I have a, a message for you, my friend. You are wrong. Right. Let's call it a day on that one. Uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>